Booth, CTY, at Johns Hopkins University, uh, not only for today for our joint effort in providing a Baltimore City Schools only uh, webinar on gifted and advanced learners and social emotional growth, but for their many years of partnership, authentic partnership, including our annual symposiums, Baltimore Emerging Scholars, professional development for our teachers and educators, and our quarterly get to know gifted nights that we've done for the past couple of years. Uh, Baltimore City Schools is very fortunate that we have such a robust, healthy, authentic partnership with CTY. And I just wanna make sure that we publicly state that as often as possible because we're very fortunate as a district to have that partnership. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Simeon Brodsky, who's the director of CTY International, and he'll talk through the logistics of our session today. Simeon? Uh, Dennis, thank you. Uh, uh, attendees, thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside, and I'm very happy that you've taken some of that uh, opportunity to be with us. I'd also like to thank Dennis and colleagues at the City Schools. So this has been an amazing partnership, and uh, it, it's always good to try new things. I, I'll have to admit that this was not the one I was planning at this point in time, but uh, it's, this is a good format, new format for us to try in a time of social distancing. Uh, one, one quick note, uh, as you are listening to the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and answers. If you look at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A button. Uh, just click that. We will be answering in real time uh, online, uh, as well as uh, filtering these questions. And Michelle will be answering some of these at the end of uh, at the end of the event. Uh, as soon as we're done with Michelle's portion, our colleagues at the city schools will also share a little bit more. So, without further ado, uh, Michelle, uh, Dr. M, please take it away. I am Michelle Muratori, and as you can see, I have two roles at Johns Hopkins, um, both. At um, CTY, I'm a senior counselor for the study of exceptional talent. And I also um, am a faculty associate in the counseling program in the School of Education there at Johns Hopkins. And in my role at SET, um, I'm not going to really talk about SET today, so you can look at our website if you'd like to learn more about it. But the thing I want to point out is that. I tend to um, provide individualized educational guidance to middle school and high school students and their families. And in working with these families, you know, regardless of what the issue is, there's always like a social and emotional component to it. And so it's really important, you know, to look at these kids holistically. So I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you today about social and emotional learning. Um, one caveat is that at CTY, we are not doing clinical mental health counseling. You know, we're not doing psychotherapy. And so if there are parents out there who um, are concerned about their children and feel like, you know, they're at a distress level where they might need some professional guidance, I would absolutely encourage you to seek, you know, professional help from a, a licensed professional. All right. Okay. With that said, um, here are the objectives that I, I want to cover today. So it's really threefold. First of all, I want to emphasize the importance of social and emotional literacy in children. Then I'm going to talk about how high ability students and their unique characteristics shape their social emotional functioning and needs. And then finally, I'd like to introduce some strategies that you might try, you know, with your kids to help them you know, to facilitate their social and emotional growth. And I'd like to make a little disclaimer here. You know, there are some things that I might mention today, maybe you've already tried, and maybe some things work better than others. I recognize that everybody is individual and, and responds to different things. So one thought that always crosses my mind is that the person you know, that we will have the longest relationship with in life is ourself. And you know what, that's true for you, that is true for your children, that's true for everybody. And so it seems like a really worthy goal for us to spend the time to develop ourselves fully and for you to help your kids, you know, to develop themselves fully so that they can enjoy their lives and enjoy their own company, if you think about it that way. So, one thing that 
I can say about working at CTY, you know, I've, I've been there for over 17 years. And I know that all of my colleagues, regardless of what program they're working with, um, whether it's our academic summer programs or our online programs, everybody is committed to helping these children to develop their, themselves fully. Um, so not just intellectually, but also socially and emotionally. It's, a, it's very much an important goal for us, All right? So you might find this to be interesting. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary, which seems amazing to me. But around 10 years ago, uh, CTY had the opportunity to conduct a survey of, of CTY alumni and their families to find out what were the benefits of the CTY programs, you know, that from their impressions. And so for somebody who's not all that familiar with CTY, you know, you might expect those academic benefits because after all, we are primarily an academic program. So you would expect the rigor and the quality of instruction and all of that. Um, and as you see, uh, one of the benefits, students really were able to sharpen their study skills and time management skills and all of that good stuff. But I think what people would be more surprised to learn is all the personal and social benefits that come from, you know, uh, participating in the summer program. And I think what this stands out or what stands out the most to me is how that sense of belonging and connectedness helps kids to thrive academically. You know, when we give gifted kids the space to be themselves in an environment where they feel accepted, where they don't have to hide their strengths or their gifts, it really goes a long, long way in, help, in helping them to like reduce their anxiety and just thrive. And um, so that is really important. Okay. So now this brings me to what we're here to talk about, which is social emotional learning. And as you see, these are, these are really important goals. Um, this process helps uh, these kids to manage their emotions, achieve positive goals, to experience empathy for other people, to establish and then maintain positive relationships, and also to make responsible decisions. And these are all really good things, like I said. And you'll notice that um, the definition comes from CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Um, that, the reason we like their definition is because it's, it's very aligned with the way that CTY um, approaches social and emotional learning. One of um, my colleagues refers to it as kind of baking it in, you know? It's, it's not a matter of, you know, we're gonna, make students take a, a class for one hour on social emotional learning, it's really infused in, in all aspects of the program. So here's a framework um, that Castle puts out that I think it really nicely depicts that idea of, um, you know, it takes a village to raise a kid. Well, it, it takes a village really to, to foster social and emotional growth. So it's not just something that happens you know, like I said, once a week in a classroom, or it, it, it needs to happen at the whole school level and also in the community level and also at home. And that's where I think uh, you as parents can play a really vital role in helping to facilitate this whole process. It's really an all-encompassing approach and, um, and, it, and it really, like I said, it's very aligned with the way that CTY use social and emotional learning. Okay, so now I'm gonna transition and talk a little bit about the characteristics of high ability students. Without, without question, if you look over this list, um, my hope is that you might be thinking about your own child and some of the characteristics they have that, um, that you see here. Now, I wouldn't expect every child to have all of these different characteristics, all right? but certainly some of them. And if you think about it, you know, the world really does benefit from people who have these characteristics. I mean, they're terrific, right? I mean, think about what's going on today. Uh, 
having high expectations is so important. Think about, uh, you know, we're all waiting for a vaccine to be developed. Imagine if scientists didn't have high expectations of themselves or their colleagues, right? And, and you know, we need people who are creative and innovative in all the different fields and disciplines, not just in the arts, but in, in technology and science and everything. Um, all of these things are really good. Um, sensitivity, empathy, the world definitely needs more of that. And it's so important to emphasize truth and equity and fairness. And, you know, I could really touch on all of these things. So these are definitely strengths. Now I want you to imagine, what if these strengths were turned up a notch? Or maybe two or three. A colleague of mine um, likes to think of it as overdone strengths. And you know what? I really like that a lot. I like that way of framing things because what it does, it never loses sight of the strength. But all too often, when, when somebody has an overdone strength, it is kind of seen as a, like a, a liability or a, or a weakness, you know? Let me give you an example. Take seeking to organize things in people. Well, it's good to have those abilities, right? Um, who would argue about that? Well, take it up a notch or two. A child might become so bossy that it's really off-putting to other people. And let's say they're so demanding, they won't consider any other viewpoints. Um, ultimately, you know, if you have a child who, who does that, not only, you know, is it, is it bad for your child, but also for the other people who feel like they're just steamrolled over, you know? So all of these um, characteristics ha can be overdone. So I, you know, you might think about, are there ways in which any of your kids have these overdone strengths? So the idea here is to think about what their strengths are and how the strengths can be used to address areas that need to be developed further. All right, so I mean, ultimately the goal really is to move from a place of dependence as a, you know, childhood to a place of independent functioning as in adulthood. And I can tell you one of the challenges that advanced learners or gifted students have is their uneven development. Another word that you might have heard for that is asynchronous development. And that's very common because if someone's abilities are so strong, we wouldn't expect their, like their emotional or social development to be up to that level, right? So, it, so it's, it's kind of, it comes with the territory, I would say. But let me give you an example of how that could be problematic. I remember this one, um, it, a set gathering, you know, for my position, I sometimes organize these social um, gatherings for these families. And I remember one time I was talking to these, these two boys, they were uh, brothers. And I was just asking them about their school experiences and you know, what it was like there. And they referred to their classmates as uh, stupid. And they said it more than one time. And it was interesting how they just used the term like very matter of factly. And I, of course, I thought, oh my gosh, oh, this isn't gonna go over well, right? It, yes, it usually doesn't when you're really condescending to other people. But I think that's a really good example of how, if, if that's not corrected, if, if these students never got the feedback, that could be a problem long-term. Imagine in adulthood, right? So that's, this is one of those types of things that really need to be addressed. Okay, so let's dive into the different um, domains of competence. Maybe for obvious reasons, self-awareness is so very important. Self-awareness really involves being able to monitor both our internal world and our external world. So it's, it's about being able to kind of name our emotions, you know, without judging them, but just being able to identify what we're feeling, making realistic appraisals of our abilities, whether neither overestimating or underestimating them, it, it, it involves being able to recognize our strengths. And the truth is, I think when people have a good sense of themselves, 
they're able to feel more confident, you know, and also more self-control because if, you know, you have a handle on what you do well, as well as those, those areas where you need to grow more. So it's, it's so important. And if you don't have self-awareness, it's going to be hard to master some of those other tasks. So you might wonder, okay, well, how can you develop self-awareness in your children? Listen, there are many different ways to do it. And a key, I think, is to help them to self-reflect. They need to be reflective. But you'll see in this image here, the yellow pages. So this might be a fun activity that you can uh, do with your kids. You know, in, in an ad, um, a business would highlight their different strengths. You know, they're presenting themselves as they would like to be seen and, and what they have to offer. So you might have your child create their own ad. Um, and in fact, you could even create your own ad too. And if you wanted to go a step further, you could have your child create an ad for you and you could also create an ad for your child. And then the important thing would be to compare your lists and talk about them. Um, and you know, sometimes, well, a part of self-awareness is getting the perceptions that other people have of you and being able to internalize that into your self-concept. So for example, let's say you know that your child has this really, really uh, sharp wit and maybe it's, maybe it's even very subtle and you might be able to point that out to them. Well, if they don't recognize that in themselves, do you see how important it would be for them to get that feedback from you? And then, you know, anyway, this might be something to do. Now, there are some techniques that you might think are a little gimmicky, and you may or may not want to try those things, but I would say an exercise is only as good as it gets you to talk. It gets you to talk and reflect. And, um, you know, okay. And th listen, there are other things I could say, but if, in the interest of time, we'll move on. Okay, so self-management is so important. And of course, it all hinges on self-awareness because if you're not self-aware, you're not going to know what you need to manage. So for example, um, you know, again, think about those strengths of your child and think about what which of these um, competencies they might do really well. If they're very good at organizing things, they may be, you know, have very good organizational skills and that's terrific. But some kids might need to work on that. Um, it, students who are really in, in passionate about what they're doing, they might have no problems at all with, with motivating themselves. But other kids might have issues here or really struggle. Now let's talk about like impulse control, for example. Um, a, a, a child who really struggles with um, maybe emotions or maybe really intense, you know, you may know about the overexcitabilities. Some gifted students feel things so deeply and intensely that um, they might, um, the way I like to put it is they might explode or implode. Um, another way to put it would be they might display externalizing behaviors or internalizing behaviors. Now, going back to that idea of, of overdone strengths, if you would turn it down a notch or two, you know, that would help them to manage themselves more and, and cause less internal distress for them, right? So you can see how some of these, these issues might play out. I'm also thinking about um, a, a, a child who has really high expectations of themselves. Well, if that's overdone and they're, maybe it turns into immobilizing perfectionism, you can imagine they might struggle with stress management. Um, it is hard to be burdened with perfectionism, you know? Right, so I think, you know, we can always come back to this later in the Q&A if, if that's helpful, but I think, managing ourselves is one of the things we all need to, to struggle with in life. All right, so I'd like to talk about what could help. Well, I'm gonna kind of list a laundry list of things and I'm not gonna go into them deeply, but I think the idea is to find things that work for you. So helping your, you know, to manage um, by using mindfulness, 
um, and meditation, um, deep breathing. You might try progressive muscle relaxation. Now, by the way, I'm talking to you, but you can also, your, your kids may also want to do it. It might be something that you all try. Um, now, if that doesn't work for everybody. But the nice thing about those things is that you can do it anywhere. You could be in your office, you could be taking a walk, you can do it anytime and anywhere. All right. Now, I personally, I don't meditate, but I know some people who must meditate every morning or, you know, their day is going to be thrown off. So again, find things that work for you. But there are other things like maybe physical exercise or yoga. Um, another category of, of, of strategies might be using self-compassion and gratitude. Now, I imagine there, there might be some parents out there who are listening who might be thinking, oh, that's so touchy-feely, you know, self-compassion, loving kindness, all of those kinds of things. But the truth is that it is helpful. And if you think about it, sometimes people are a lot more compassionate towards other people. They're a lot kinder to other people than to themselves. So if your child struggles with having a really harsh internal critic, you know, you might see if they could engage in some of this self-compassion. All right, another thing that is helpful is to help them to set achievable goals. Sometimes it helps to do something, you know, even if it's making small little goals, that's, that's important. And then finally, um, let me just talk about the importance of, you know, well, positive self-talk. It's the, how we talk to ourselves really can affect how we manage ourselves. Oftentimes, if we have a thought, like let's say a very critical thought about ourselves, that might lead to us feeling really bad and that might lead us to engaging in some kind of self-sabotaging behavior. So anyway, I know that's simplistic, but sometimes cognit cognitive techniques like that can be helpful. All right, moving on here, the importance of social awareness. And of course, it encompasses all of these different things like perspective taking, empathy, appreciating diversity, and respect for others. I would like to talk about empathy for a moment. Irvin Yalom, who, who really is a giant in the, the psychotherapy field, um, he's, he's known as an existential psychotherapist or psychiatrist, he talks about empathy in a way that I, I really like. He talks about it as looking out a person's window. Um, all right, not just like stepping in a person's shoes, but it's like looking out their window. And what I like about that is that when you do that, you don't need to get lost in a person's world. You know, you don't need to lose yourself in having empathy for others, but you can see from their perspective how it is. How, how they view things. Now, I know from working with gifted students over the years, many of them are very empathic and deeply empathic. And if it's an overdone strength, you can imagine how it might be even painful to be so empathic um, and, and to be so sensitive. So that could be uh, an issue, um, the, the issue of absorbing people's pain and other people's feelings, right? But on the other hand, um, it, you know, there are some kids who might need to develop their empathy. Like I, I gave you the example of, of the boys who were referring to their classmates as being stupid. Um, one thing that a parent did that I always thought was, that was brilliant is he put his son into an activity that he wasn't really all that adept in. Not, not to shame him at all. I think that's never a good idea to shame your, your kids. But what it did do was it put him in touch with how it is for other kids who, you know, who are challenged in other ways. And at one point, the, you know, the dad, he turned it into a teaching moment for, for his child. And he said, now you understand what it's like for kids who are challenged to do math. And that boy really got it. It was a, an aha moment for him, all right? So I think there are some maybe, um, maybe proactive strategies that you can try just to help 
to broaden your child's perspective and help them to understand what it's like for other people and that everyone thinks differently, everyone has different agendas. So this is a picture of um, the Milan train station. And, you know, I imagine as everybody's sheltering in place and, and staying at home a lot, you know, you might be visiting virtual museums. That could be something to do. And just, um, you know, so you can take any picture that involves people and you might, um, I'm not sure what you would want to call this activity, but I'm just going to call it wondering out loud. All right, so you might wonder aloud, you know, I wonder what that woman holding her bag, what is she thinking? Where did she just come from? Did she lose something? You know, what, whoever's in the picture, it could be different perspectives. Um, and that way it broadens their perspective. All right. Okay, I, again, this is another really important area. So having social awareness and being able to, to take the perspective of the other, you know, is important. But then they also need to be able to um, relate to others and, and develop those skills. Now, many gifted students do this, you know, very well and with ease, but there also are some students who might struggle in this area. But I just can't overestimate the importance of it. There are some students I know who, who maybe they're more introverted, they might have maybe less of a need to have a huge social network, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we all need people. We're human beings, we're you know, relational beings, and we need to be able to interact you know, at work, in our personal lives, socially, and et cetera. So I, I recognize that right now has been a very difficult time um, for families because you know, a lot of kids, uh, you know, nobody expected this, this pandemic, perhaps except for some public health experts, right? But I think a lot of people are caught off guard. And so a lot of activities have been canceled. So I realize that it's very difficult right now. However, I would say that one strategy is, you know, to help your kids to connect with others. I think that's what, um, as I told you about the benefits of CTY, it's important for kids to have those opportunities to practice their relationship skills. So, you know, it could be starting an online book club or something like that. And when things open up, engaging in like maybe even academic competitions where like-minded kids who have shared interests can connect, you know. But in terms of parenting, I think that Good communication is so important, and often, you know, it's those in-between times that you have, because I know that parents are very, very busy um, and stressed with everything that's going on. But even before this, there's just so much going on in everyone's lives. But you have those moments where you might be just in the car driving, or maybe you're walking, or um, hiking, or, you know, eating dinner playing a game, those moments are golden. And whether you're looking at each other face to face or sitting side by side, I think, you know, embrace those moments and recognize when you have an opportunity to really connect with your child. Um, they will remember that. And um, that's, that's so important. Okay, the last domain that I'm wanting to talk about is responsible decision making. Um, I probably don't need to tell you about the importance of that. I think, you know, we're seeing this in the world right now. Um, those who are making really responsible decisions and thoughtful decisions and, and also sometimes when people are not making very responsible decisions. Um, it, it, it is really important and it always dawns on me that High ability students often will be in a position maybe of authority or leadership one day. And it's important that they use their power, I think, in an ethical and fair way, you know, um, for their own sake, but also for others' sakes, right? And so I think it's important to help them now to develop those tools to make well-informed decisions. 
Um, sometimes people assume that gifted students are, they have everything figured out so they don't need really any guidance. They're so smart, they'll just figure things out. But, but that's not true. Um, they really do need guidance in helping to navigate situations, you know? An another thing about decision making, by the way, is that I've encountered with many different families over the years, is sometimes higher stakes decisions can be very agonizing. Very agonizing because, you know, both the parents and the kids see all the nuances involved. And, and so it's, you know, how do you decide one thing and then you're foreclosing on another option? That sounds good too. So learning how to deal with ambiguity and, and processing all of that is so important. So again, it's very important to be able to, to do that while your kids are still young and while they can incorporate it, um, you know. All right, so here um, is, a, is a picture of a, a boy that's being teased by um, other kids, or at least that's what I think is going on here. Who knows really, right? But let's assume that's what's happening here. Um, one thing that parents can do is maybe talk about hypothetical situations that involve some level of complexity or, or ethics and help your child to reason through the course of action that they would take, you know? So this might involve you know, identifying what is the problem, what are the different issues, and then analyzing those issues. Who are the stakeholders involved? Um, what are the different, you know, the pros and the cons of different courses of action? How would people be affected? What are the outcomes and you know so forth and, and about being able to evaluate it. Um, when, you, when you're able to do that, um, they'll internalize that process. And it doesn't mean that it won't be hard later on when they're dealing with a really complex issue, but at least they will have some framework for trying to work through it. And that often helps to reduce anxiety and stress. All right, one thing I would like to add is it's important to choose scenarios that aren't going to trigger them, you know? Um, there are scenarios, for example, that might involve life and death. And I think right now, when there's so much of that going on, let's, you know, maybe steer clear of that. But you be the judge. You know your children the best. And so I think trusting yourself is, is so important. All right. So finally, and, and um, this brings me to the, the last point, and maybe the most important of all, which is the importance of active listening. Um, I can't say enough about it. As a counselor, it, it's one of the most powerful tools. Um, listening to what your children are saying, and, and maybe also not saying, paying attention to their body language and their nonverbal cues, um, and uh, you know, is so important. Be, uh, you know, feeling validated and heard goes a long, long way in terms of helping um, your kids, you know? So even if you have a different point of view and a different perspective, if you first hear them out and then you offer your view, then I think it tends to go a little better, okay? Um, well, this, um, kind of brings me to the end of, of my formal comments, but um, I look forward to hearing what your questions are. And I'm going to now turn this over to um, my colleague, Simeon, who's going to field your, your questions. Okay, again, to remind everybody, as we're going through the question and answer, if you have a question, please submit it through by using the question and answer button. Uh, we will keep all microphones muted, so I will be the one who is reading those. Uh, Michelle, to start things off, uh, we had a, a parent who, who wrote in uh, asking the following question. Uh, how, how do you, I help my son recognize that mistakes are okay and that if you mess something up, you don't need to tear up the entire sheet of paper, but you can actually make a correction to that one particular piece? Oh my goodness, that's a very good question. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that um, questions about perfectionism came up because I find that to be really common among high ability students. Um, I'd like to answer the question in a couple of different ways. 
Um, one is maybe the, the short term, you know, addressing, uh, you know, that particular, like a particular issue like that. And then the, the larger issue, of course, is perfectionism in general. Um, you know how we were talking earlier about using strengths to address those other areas? I think, you know, one thing that, that you can do is appeal to your, your child's reasoning abilities and analytical strengths to, to address that. So let's say um, on, on, a, on a project, let's say 5% of it your child isn't really satisfied with and they're really frustrated or something. You might actually say to them something like, well, if only 5% of your, assi you know, your assignment has problems, how efficient would it be to start over with it? And so, you know, you can continue on with that dialogue, but the idea is using their analytical abilities, you know, to help them address how that's, you know, not all that reasonable to just start all over. Um, and by the way, I do want to add, I, I once had a, a friend in graduate school, she was a grown woman, who actually would do that, she would, every time she got off, uh, started with her dissertation and got feedback, just like one little bit of feedback, she'd throw it away and start over and try on something new. So this is a, really a great question because you can see how if carried into adulthood, that could be a problem. Um, another idea would be to take it out of that context and use a different context that maybe wouldn't push your child's buttons as much. So for example, like, um, like if your child has a favorite meal or something, let's say Thanksgiving dinner, and you, know, you talk about, oh, you know, all the different food you know, items that are you prepared, but let's say there's one little dish that's, that's pretty bad, you know? Maybe it's the, you know, the green beans or something that were burnt. Now you could say to your child, so what should I do? Should I just throw away the whole meal or should we just fix that one thing? All right. Now hopefully they won't say, well, just get rid of the whole meal and let's order a pizza. But, and they could, but let's hope not. But you see what I'm saying? It's like, and if you don't like that example, come up with a different example, but where it, it takes it out of that context with something that's not nearly as threatening and makes them see that it would be kind of, you know, not all that helpful just to, to scrap the whole thing. So that's kind of addressing that particular question. But, um, you know, living as a perfectionist can be very burdensome. Um, it can be immobilizing, in fact. And so I would want to know, I would want to explore what that means, you know, to your child. What does it mean to be perfect? And what does it mean to not be perfect? And what does it say about you? Or do you think it says about you? And I think what, where you wanna go is, is to kind of get at some of those, uh, those core mistaken beliefs. You know, so it could be something like, well, I won't be accepted, you know, or, um, everyone's going to be ashamed of me, or I'm not smart, or something like this, right? And then, then you're kind of getting to the heart of it, and you can try to challenge, very compassionately, challenge those beliefs. And again, you might appeal to their, um, their strong analytical reasoning abilities and say, so what evidence do you have for that, that you're going to be rejected if you make some mistakes, or that you're not smart, you know? Anyway, those are just a few ideas I have, but, and surely there are others, but exploring the meaning is important. I think this question, this question of meaning uh, is, is hugely important. I, I just think of a conversation I had with my own daughter where, you know, where she was pointing out her perfectionism tends to spike when things are easy so that she has a greater challenge for her she feels like she can let go of. Now we have another another question mm -hmm. taking a slightly different path. Uh, this is going back to the question of empathy. 
and when talking about empathy, you talk about students, uh, young people who needed to develop their empathy, and others who uh, had a heightened sense of sense of, sense of empathy. Uh, right. This, this question: uh, My child's over empathy shows up as bursts of anger uh, because of others' lack of empathy. Uh, how, how might you? What might you suggest in that kind of situation? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, it, actually, you know, it seems like some there's more than one strength there. Um, let me put that list up again, okay? Let's see. I'm gonna put up this. Here we go. Um, it it sounds like um, that this student who's so empathic and so attuned to other people's feelings um, gets angry when other people aren't, and that kind of is emphasizing truth and fairness and all of that, you know. Um, and and you know they also might have their own, um, you know, feel things very intensely. And so these, these really are gifts. So I think, um, you know, um, one thing you don't want to do is, is shut the student down. Um, it comes from a good place, but if, if that anger, let's say it's expressed in an inappropriate way, then I wonder if you can um, you know, validate the feeling and where it comes from, but let's say if the anger were inappropriate, then to address that and help them to maybe manage their, their anger. That goes back to the self-management, you know? Um, I don't know if that adequately addresses this, but um, I imagine that's, that's uh, painful to see. So there's, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with feeling anger. And that's important. Sometimes people get that message that it's not okay to express anger. So I think that's important to validate the feeling and then separate the feeling from the behavior, you know? I don't know if that answers the question. No, I think it, I think it gives, gives a good insight. And I, I particularly appreciate this question of anger because there are times where you know, where people are being mistreated and that anger can be you know can be productive if channeled appropriately absolutely i mean anger when channeled appropriately it can lead to action and so i think you know into social activism or so i think one, one thing um you know active coping strategies tend to be helpful right what can i do with this these feelings when we feel helpless, that's when I think it can, we can just, it eats away at us, right? When we feel like there's nothing we can do about it and we're just, you know, letting that anger simmer or boil over or whatever, right? So I think how can we channel that into something that would be productive? And that reminds me of, a, of another point, which is, I think, very important. It's being able to identify what is within our control and what is not within our control, you know, and also for parents to help them to understand or help their children to understand the difference between the two, you know, and where can we take action? So Michelle, could you, could you talk a little bit about parents and what parents might do to, to model uh, some of this, but I think that you know, when you're talking about self-compassion or positive self-talk as a parent, often you know, we have a sense of what we'd like our sons and daughters to do, but we fail to do that ourselves. Um, yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, that's a that's a great um, point to bring up. Um, I think, first of all, acknowledging that, um, acknowledging that that this can be a challenge. You know, easier said than done, and I think when words are empty and it's like, oh, go do this and go do that, but then when children don't see their parents doing that, um, I think children take their cues from their parents, you know, so it's, it, the modeling is very important. So one thing I would say is, you know, think about all of the things we talked about and how do they apply to you? Um, like even with regard to self-compassion, are you compassionate towards yourself? Are, do you tend to be a harsh critic of, of yourself? And, you know, 
this could be, this could lead to a really good heart to heart conversation with your kids about what you struggle with. You know, I think that's important to share. Like, this is where I struggle, but I'm working on it. And if they see you working on, on it, even if you're not perfect at it, I think that's good. That's good modeling. You're human, you know? Yeah, I know for my own daughters, one thing that, that's helped, helped us is if, if I put them in the role of pointing out when I'm not doing a good job of it, because they feel like I'm not always the one who's pestering them, but they, they also have a, have a role in pestering me, help me, right. help me improve. That's right. M mutual pestering. <laughs> Uh, so, so we have time for at least to introduce this last question, Michelle, and I think that this is going to be a nice transition to, uh, to our colleagues in city schools as well. Uh, it really is about con connection and how, what are some steps to help young people find, uh, find others with similar interests? Uh, are there ways in, some of these questions are more specific about CTY, but just not specific to CTY. What are good ways to begin making those connections? Uh, finding people with similar interests. And I think uh, city schools will transition and, and be able to speak to that as well. Okay, you know, that's a great question. Um, in fact, um, in the set counseling that I do, this, is, this often comes up. And one of the reasons that we promote things like academic competitions, um, for example, math counts or and I'm not just endorsing math counts, I'm just thinking of ones that come to my mind, um, but like science fairs, or even uh, there are other kinds of competitions, or chess competitions, or whatever it is, that, that center around your child's interest. The idea is that it brings together kids who have a shared interest. And we know that like-minded peers tend to connect better than, you know what I mean, if, if, if if, if your child doesn't connect with other kids because they don't share interests, that's not gonna be as an enriching experience for them. But that's why competitions can be a good place for them to meet other kids. Like this kid's really into science too, or astrophysics and, you know, and sometimes they, they meet each other at these different competitions. That's just one thing, you know, but that's why summer programs are, are um, I think such a wonderful connecting experience for them because when they meet other kids who are kind of like them, they feel like they're part of something. And so look for opportunities, but I would start with your child's interests. Let the, let the interests lead the way. And then you can find, you know, some of those opportunities. And by the way, um, for parents out there on CTY's website, under resources, we have a listing of academic opportunities. I think it might be academic listings or something. When you click it on, you'll see we have like academic competitions, we have internships, which usually are reserved for older students, you know, 11th grade or so, but they're broken down into content areas. Like, you know, even within the science, it's broken down. It's a very good list. And um, you might look at that and see if there are activities that your child might like to uh, participate in. Now, right now, a lot of things are either on hold or on, they're, they're trying to transition to online because of the COVID pandemic. But you know, at some point, they'll, they'll resume. And anyway, that's, that's just one thought. Great. Michelle, thank you so much for, for taking the time this afternoon and for a very thought-provoking talk and, and the answers. Uh, we're gonna transition now so you can uh, share your screen or uh, stop sharing your screen and we'll transition to my colleagues at the city schools and they'll share a little bit about what's going on with the city schools. And as a city school, proud city school parent, this is one of my favorite parts of these, uh, these talks. Well, thanks, Simeon. I'm gonna hope Ray is starting to uh, share the screen. Um, so, oh, there we go. So we're gonna make this as succinct as possible for those uh, so we can round up the hour. Um, again, so I'm Dennis Jutras, the coordinator of Gift and Advanced Learning. Uh, we're joined by Ray Limer. Wanna say hi, Ray? Maybe not. 
<laughs> and Joyce Jackson. <I'm> here. <laughs> <laughs> and Joyce Jackson. Um, so on the next slide, what you'll see is some of you may not be aware that uh, we have provided on the next slide um, a number of GAL resources um, that are found. If you go to the city schools website and you go under distance learning and you go, scroll to the bottom after all the grade levels, you will find one that says gifted and advanced learning. There are a set of six different 40 page long documents that are broken down as follows. You can see on the screen. So, you know, for an example, they, they, break, they break down the following ways. The first part is basically an overview of some best practices on how to work with your gifted learners. The first, the section after that is uh, specific to what we call primary talent development. So basically pre-K to second grade lessons that you can work with along with your child. These are all de designed to be project-based or problem-based learning. They are not specific to what is being taught in the curriculum. Um, if you've been doing this for a number of weeks, your child may have grown tired of what is being taught in the curriculum or may have exceeded this many, many months ago. So these are meant to be opportunities for you to infuse learning, to kind of re-engage them into the excitement of figuring things out. And then, uh, so the pre-K through uh, second grade stuff was assembled by Joyce Jackson, our ed specialist. Uh, our ed specialist, Ray Limer, put together the third through eighth grade project-based and problem-based learning opportunities, everything from creating new inventions to creating an ultimate garden. And then uh, I put together a series of nine through 12 problem-based learning prompts. Um, each of them, there's one at the local, one at the national, and one at the international level. Um, again, not meant to be graded, not meant to be scored, not, nothing more than simply, hey, here's something you can engage your children with um, and, and help them to see learning as fun as it's supposed to be. But also please make sure you, you check out those resources. We've also highlighted a specific digital resource every one of those six weeks that we put that together. We also wanted to bring to your attention that before the uh, pandemic struck us, we were in the midst of getting ready to present to the city schools board a first ever Baltimore City gifted policy and regulations. So uh, those will be IHBB, um, which I'm sure is very exciting to all of you, and IHBBRA, that's the regulations piece. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, you'll see these are brand new. Baltimore City, as long as history as it has, has never had a formal policy on gifted and advanced learners. Uh, we are hopefully we are hopeful that by the end of the summer we will have an adopted official policy and regulations. They don't replace anything in existence. They're brand new. They are 100% aligned to what the state Comar regulations and act. In fact, Ray, Joyce, and myself shared with five of our colleague uh, districts. Uh, we went through a peer evaluation. We received incredibly high re remarks regarding the proposed policy because it matches 100% what the state expects regarding gifted education in the state of Maryland. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a quick little overview, um, which basically, we usually chunk these things, but we, the big takeaway here regarding the policy as proposed is that we're talking all students are eligible for identification and all means all. We cannot say it more succinctly and more clearly than that. We also acknowledge that there are students who may have uh, learning challenges. Um, and a lot of times they'll be just identified as special education, they leave it at that. We have long made it a point to emphasize what is called twice exceptional learners, those students who have the high capacity to learn as well as those who may be struggling with some challenges to learn. One does not exclude you from the other. And we wanna make sure that we put these on the radar of not only parents, but of educators throughout the district as well. So we establish a universal screening policy. We articulate what we expect for instruction to take place. We talk about sustained professional learning for our teachers, and we publicly will hold ourselves accountable as to who's identified, who are we missing, how can we do better? And every year that would be reported to the board and is publicly viewable. Uh, we need to be held accountable. That's the only way we're gonna get better. The next slide. Um, and again, they're just big four big buckets, which are kind of just hit identification, instruction, professional learning, and program evaluation. I do want to emphasize the universal screening. We screen all kindergarten students. Um, we will have to take a pause uh, depending on what the new normal looks like in the fall. Traditionally, we've uh, given every uh, new kindergarten student a Naglieri assessment, a nonverbal ability screener. Um, depending on when we get back into school, that may delay that, but every kindergarten student will be assessed in that way uh, to get them on a radar to start thinking. One test doesn't 
necessarily exclude you if you don't do particularly well. We're always looking and mining the data as we go forward. Next slide. Um, and what's going to happen is those of you that were able to join us today and those who will be joining remotely afterwards, if we have your email address, we'll be sending out a survey on behalf of city schools. And on that, we'd really appreciate your feedback because on that survey, we're looking for the following. Uh, my team and I would like to host virtual office hours uh, for parents that want to just drop in, ask general questions. We can certainly then arrange for one-on-one -on -one consultation if you have a specific question about your child. But if you want clarification because the school told you one thing, you read another, you heard something from your neighbor, this is the chance to ask those of us that actually live, breathe, and do this stuff every day um, to help answer your questions. So completing the survey, one, we want your input about potential office hours, what times might work well for you. Two, we would like your input as to, would you be interested in future CTY webinars? If so, what topics would you like to hear about? In a similar fashion, the GAL office, the Gift and Advanced Learning office, would like to also offer webinar opportunities. So if you have some topics that you're interested in, we're more than happy to put that together and figure out a time and way to broadcast that. But we want you to know that we care about your children um, almost as much as you do. And we want to make sure that, we're, that you know that we're advocates for your children. We're here to help you, to assist you. We don't want the progress that you've made on their behalf, that the district has made on their behalf, to be waylaid by the pandemic. Yes, this has caused us to pause, but a pause does not mean stop and it does not mean retreat. And I, we just wanted you from the GAL office to hear that we do care about your children and we want to work with you to help them to reach their fullest potential possible. And so be on the lookout for that email with that link. And again, here's our contact information. You're more than welcome to email. If you have a question specifically about a pre-K to two student, uh, Joyce Jackson's gonna be your go-to person. Um, early elementary through middle grades, uh, Ray Limer's gonna be your expert. Uh, high school, AP, anything in general regarding policy procedures, a principal told you something, you have a question about it, you can hit me up, Dennis Jutras, and I'll be, I'll be more than happy to handle those questions. Uh, I think that takes us to four o'clock, just about. Um, Simeon, I think you want to kind of direct us into the next part of this. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, as as we had mentioned, this has been recorded. Uh, we'll send a follow-up email to those of you who have registered, uh, which will let you know where it's housed if you'd like to watch it again or share it with any of your, uh, your friends or, or neighbors. Uh, you have the contact information for Dennis and crew, CTY. The easiest way to contact us is ctyinfo, I-N-F-O, at jhu.edu, and we'd be happy to uh, help in any way possible. Again, thank you all. Uh, a special thanks to the city schools for this partnership and the opportunity to work together uh, for the betterment of Baltimore City's public school students. And with that, we will say uh, goodbye.